I can either send you out an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with 12 point font that's folded in thirds and put into a business envelope, or I can do something else. Uh, and so we've, we've worked really from that initial, you know, new member package all the way through, um, you know, other aspects of, of the journey that we know a hundred percent of our, our members receive and are kind of working our way through that. So would you rather read the box score of your baseball team or read the sports illustrated version of, uh, you know, an in-depth report on the star pitcher, or do you, wa- would you like to watch a 30 for 30, you know, kind of expose on, on how the team is done? Hey, welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, the first global community connecting top tier independent management consultants with one another. We just heard from today's guest, David Minifee, the chief experience officer and executive vice president of corporate strategy at Centene Corporation. Centene is a Fortune 500 company that provides a portfolio of services to government sponsored healthcare programs. In this episode, David explains to me the role and responsibilities of a chief experience officer, which includes and expands the responsibilities he previously held as the chief marketing officer at Centene. And you can learn more about Centene on their website, of course, centene.com, and that's C-E-N-T-E-N-E.com. And you can learn more about David's background and connect with him on his LinkedIn profile, and a link is in the show notes. Final note before the episode, I'd like to welcome new listeners, Pierre C. and Alp S., who have recently signed up for the weekly Unleashed email. If you too would like to receive the transcript of each episode, plus other bonus features right in your inbox, email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. Hello, Dave. Welcome to the show. I'm very happy to be here, Will. Thanks a lot for having me. Dave, I want to hear on today's show about what it means to be a chief experience officer. But before we get to your role, just give us a overview of, of what Centene Corporation does. Big company, Fortune 100 company. A lot of people not necessarily, you know, haven't heard of it. Give us, give us an overview of Centene. Sure. Uh, and, and you're right. A, a lot of people have not heard of uh, Centene Corporation in part because we don't go to market uh, really under the Centene brand. The, the Centene brand is really designed for current employees, prospective employees, investors, and government regulators and, and legislatures where we're uh, partnering with states to conduct business on their behalf. And, and our business model is primarily uh, as a managed care organization for government programs. So what are government health care programs? They include Medicaid, which is primarily for the underserved populations, Medicare, which in general is for the over 65 population, although there are other product categories where, where Medicare provides services. And we're also very active on the health care exchanges, the, the Obamacare plans inside the country. And we serve over 14 million members currently. We also have the TRICARE West region of the United States. So that's uh, healthcare services for Department of Defense, military personnel, and their, their families. Medicaid is a joint program that's administered by each state government. They put in funds and, and also receive funds from the federal government. Medicare is funded by the federal government. Uh, and the exchange is, is a combination of some government subsidies and then private citizens who sign up for the exchanges are also paying all or, or portions of their premiums associated with that product. So with, with Medicaid, I, just being a naive person, I always kind of just assume that, okay, it's the government program. I mean, I mean the government would have all these government employees kind of processing claims and, and, and doing all that stuff. But, but is, is that not how it works? So the government actually would contract with a company like Centene to manage it at a given state level? Yes. Ma- many state governments choose to contract with 
private managed care organizations or insurers to run the program on their behalf. You know, probably 20 years ago, the majority of state uh, Medicaid programs were were run by the state governments in what's called a fee for service model, where there's basically a, a you know publicly available fee schedule pr- published for a variety of services, and then uh, physicians and other medical personnel will will bill you know on a transactional basis for providing those services. What many of the states have found over the past couple of decades, though, is that there are more efficient ways to uh, run the program and, and to hold the, uh, the providers to a common standard. And so as a managed care organization, we help to provide additional assistance to the portion of the population that is really using the majority of the services. So in those cases, think about um, somebody that's got multiple medical conditions. Uh, you know, I might be, uh, you know, have heart disease and be overweight and have diabetes. And what we do is we work with the providers in each of those specialty areas to help coordinate care and to ensure compliance on the part of the member with that regimen of care. And when you provide that that extra high touch service via uh, nurses or, or social workers that uh, make up a, a large portion of our employee base then you find out that you actually get um, better health outcomes and you can lower costs. So if you think about uh, you know, driving a car, uh, you probably take it in for an oil change every once in a while. If you don't do that, eventually the car will have very serious problems. The same is true in, in health care. As long as we're doing the little things right along the way, uh, we can potentially preemptively solve bigger problems that could otherwise come later on. So does the does the state government contract with Centene to manage sort of the entire Medicaid program in the state of X, or are they just carving out specific populations like, okay, all of the diabetes patients will have you kind of care? Yeah, that's, a, that's another great question. In general, you know, the state government will contract with uh, more than one managed care organization inside their state. So, for instance, in a, a smaller state like New Hampshire, they might contract with two or three providers across the entire uh, state uh, population. In a larger state uh, like Florida, they might divide the state into, you know, 11 regions and then bid the contracts out for uh, multiple bidders and and multiple winners in in each of those regions. Some states do have separate programs uh, with uh, smaller populations that they might award to a single carrier statewide, but in general, uh, states really enjoy having a couple of players inside the state to ensure competition. And and, uh, we, we think that breeds more innovation in the space as well as, as we compete for business. And then within a given geography, like in those 11 regions of Florida, if you live in Tampa, are you assigned to one of those providers or do individuals actually have to choose between multiple ones? So individuals will be given a choice. Um, and if they don't choose, there are some algorithms used to assign members to you know one plan or the other. You know, generally speaking, you know, states don't like having a, a, a single health plan that has kind of monopoly power in any specific region, and so they they have ways of uh, divvying up the populations to ensure that it's that it's fair and that there's good competition. Okay, so then for a patient then that has selected one of the Centene brands, and so they might it might not be called Centene; it'd be you know have some a, a brand for that local plan. Your company would 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 kind of do all of the billing, but then also if it's a patient that has some complications, you would provide some extra kind of nursing or extra sort of services to make sure that patient you know stays more healthy, and then therefore kind of reduce the total costs over time. Yes, that's 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 approximately correct. So we we do handle you know assigning members to a primary care physician. Uh, you know, we handle, uh, you know, making payments and, and uh, adjudicating claims. 
Uh, and then for uh, those populations that are receiving, you know, kind of higher touch, then, uh, you know, we've got uh, folks that, that help do that as well. Okay, great. So now I have a bit better understanding of the company. Let's talk about your role. Um, Chief Experience Officer, what, what, does, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> Anything I want, Will. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I was hired a little over seven years ago as the first Chief Marketing Officer for Centene. Uh, at that time, we were uh, a little over $5 billion in, in total revenue. I was hired in uh, in 2012. So the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, not yet implemented, but our CEO, Michael Neidorf, uh, knew that um, more consumerism was coming to the healthcare space than, than kind of currently existed. And so he was interested in having somebody with a consumer packaged goods background come in and you know bring some outside industry thinking in, into the company. And so I had spent 12 years at Procter & Gamble doing traditional brand management stuff on uh, really super exciting and sexy brands like uh, Sh- Charmin Bath Tissue and, and Yukonuba Dog Food. You know, Charmin is poop coming out and do- dog food is poop going in. So I can talk about that whole cycle maybe later on or for your outtakes, uh, which is fascinating. But, um, <laughs> you know, in general, what I did for the first couple of years here as the as the CMO was understand why does the company exist? What's our what's our purpose? And, and it helped to articulate that. So we exist to transform the health of the community one person at a time. Our mission is to improve health outcomes and, and lower costs, and we do that in, in partnership with uh, the state uh, and, and federal governments. And we did a lot of work to understand how do our brands in each state show up, and is there a more efficient uh, way to go to market? And we decided, that yes, yes, there was, even though we operate as Sunshine State in Florida and Peach State Health Plan and in Georgia, there are still things about these populations that are very similar from one state to the next, and, and we should probably apply those sets of understanding from one state to the other. And so we worked for about three years to put a, a process and, and discipline in place uh, that we felt really good about. And then we started doing some uh, consumer uh, segmentation and, and journey mapping, and we realized what most people who have a high degree of interaction with the healthcare system realize, which is the healthcare experience is a lot of times not super awesome. So on Siegel and Gale's brand simplicity index, health insurance ranks at the bottom and on uh, Temkin's experience rating, healthcare uh, health plans rank at or near the bottom. And in both cases, we're below the cable companies. And I, I haven't met anybody who's really enthralled with their television service provider. So, you know, how is it that healthcare, which can actually save people's lives, do worse than the cable companies? And I think the answer is is uh, pretty simple, which is no matter how many pay-per-view programs you order from your cable company, you still only get 12 bills a year. And, you know, Will, I'd like to ask you, how many pieces of correspondence do you get throughout the course of the year from the healthcare system? Oh, my God. It is, I mean, beyond just the bills, like every single right. time There's, you go, it's... Right. And, I, you know, I've, I've, and I've posted a couple of times on LinkedIn about some of the crazy ones that you get that just don't make any sense at all. You know, for one thing, like sometimes, uh, you know, I've gotten bills where it said, okay, the allowable amount is $50 and whatever and then your plan you know allowed this and it says okay but then you actually owe money like owe more than the actual like amount that they bill like well they billed you fifty dollars but your plan allows like 200 and then you owe 200 like what i owe more than they billed me what right and and, just- and, and then we <laughs> use we use this jargon that nobody understands because there's insurance there's co-insurance there's deductible, there's a copay, there's a premium, you know, the list kind of goes on and on and no one really understands what, what any of that 
that stuff means. And so as we kind of got into the details of how frustrating the consumer journey can be in the healthcare space, we said, okay, I, you know, you, you cannot market your way out of, you know, a mediocre product experience. We really need to work uh, on the product experience. And so at that time, we changed my title from chief marketing officer to chief experience officer. And although my sphere of control did not uh, expand uh, all that much, my sphere of influence did. So we do a lot of work now with HR and with IT and with operations to really understand what are the points of friction that we as a company are delivering to our members and to our providers and what are the things that we can do do to address those challenges and and uh, you know get these friction points you know at, at least to neutral. So let's talk about a few. So how do you measure the customer experience? So we use a, a an internal uh, satisfaction measurement. We, we have in the past used Net Promoter Score as well, but uh, we think that customer satisfaction which we are uh, moving to uh, assess after every interaction that a member has with us when they when they call in or or use the website and you uh, you know ha- have probably seen you know these automatic surveys that pop up after you shop for something online you know and gives you the opportunity to opt in or opt out of a, of a quick survey you know we're using tools like that to to make assessments we also do you know a variety of you know re- uh, live member research throughout the year to to get a a feeling for how we're doing through that mechanism as well. Tell me about any work that you do to kind of map out the customer journey across different types of transactions. So, you know, if a customer needs to call in to dispute a bill or to get some kind of special thing approved, do you have any kind of work where you sort of map that out and see the end-to-end time and the number of touches it takes and then work to do some lean ops type things around those processes? Yes. So for for anybody who's done, uh, you know, consumer journey mapping work, whether it's through, uh, you know, some sort of human-centered design workshop or, or through a marketing uh, workshop, we do, we do that work uh, every couple of years on each of our product lines. So we're kind of in rotation between Medicaid, uh, the exchanges, Medicare, and and uh, our complex care business on how we assess those those journeys. But in general, you know, for each uh, segment of the population, we know that there are between 80 and 150 different types of touch points that a member could have with us throughout the course of the year. We've identified, you know, where there's the most friction and have, you know, put programs in place to uh, address those things. The four kind of broad umbrella areas that we've really identified on on how to activate are on communication, uh, access to care, respect, uh, and education. And really respect is the most important one because as we're dealing with you know, uh, underserved populations, and as we're dealing with people who are who are experiencing healthcare uh, issues, it's really important that we move uh, forward in, in in all aspects of our touch points uh, with a degree of empathy and uh, and respect and empowerment that we think is important. Otherwise, uh, we're just adding stress to what's already a stressful situation. How do you manifest that? part that piece around respect how do you you know measure how respectful are we being and how do you work to train your employees to to be more empathetic or respectful yeah so we have a a variety of training available to to call center staff and and other employees you know we've got a a very robust kind of annual uh, employee training program that we undertake here at Centene. And so, and then there's also, you know, most of our calls are, you know, recorded, you know, that, that typical, your call is being recorded for training purposes, uh, message that you hear in a, when you call into a lot of call centers, we do that as well. And so we're always trying to, uh, educate our employees and, and help them to manifest that empathy that we, we think is important that our members and providers receive. What have you found are some of the areas that you know are kind of the most important around 
improving the experience that are sort of the biggest pain points for people. I'm curious to hear the story of what you've done to you know improve those those pain points. Well, I mean, it, it all starts with joining the plan. Mm. You know, I can either send you out an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with 12 point font that's folded in thirds and put into a business envelope, or I can do something else. Uh, and so we've, we've worked really from that initial, you know, new member package all the way through, um, you know, other aspects of, of the journey that we know a hundred percent of our, our members receive and are kind of working our way through that. So would you rather, read the box score of your baseball team or read the sports illustrated version of, uh, you know, an in-depth report on the star pitcher, or do you, wa- would you like to watch a 30 for 30, you know, kind of expose on, on how the team is done. And, and really what we're trying to do is understand how do we take what is a required transaction and elevate that into an engagement that's that's valued by the member and um, not likely just to be thrown into the recycling bin the way you know I, I kind of do with my explanation of benefit documents that I receive that says this is not a bill across the top. You know, it's you know a, a, any way that we can stop frustrating people and, and wasting their time, but instead of using you know black and white, we use color instead of using words. If we can provide diagrams or info informatics, then, then we do that as well. So it starts with the things, uh, you know, as basic as welcome to the plan and how do we make people feel welcome as opposed to uh, feel like they're a burden. Yeah. How have you done that rather than just the, like you said, the eight and a half, 11 folded up, what what sorts of things have you done to, on that very first touch point, the welcome piece? yeah, so we we basically, I don't know, maybe six years ago said, hey, what we think is one of the best in class pieces of communication across any industry is the airline safety card, right? When you get into the uh, an airplane, you can pull that thing out of the back of the seat in front of you and take a look at it, and it uses either very few or no words what to do if the oxygen mask comes down or, or, or how to get it out of the plane uh, in the case of an emergency. And so we've really taken this design philosophy to heart. Our welcome packets are just that. They are packets of uh, you know easy to digest information with a, a member identification card and some other materials that you know, is something that you can hang on to and, and uh, not misplace. And we've really made the use of uh, a very specific color palette. Our our brand colors are uh, raspberry, orange, lime, and grape. We specifically chose those colors because they're they're warm and welcoming. And uh, as I like to say, they they are sorbet flavors. So how <laughs> how can anybody get mad at being treated to a sorbet? <laughs> You know, one thing, and this is a little off topic, but one thing that I always wonder about every time I pay a medical bill is how they send me this, you know, the bill, and then you pull off the slip at the bottom to write in your credit card number, and the place for your credit card number is super small. So, (laughs) like, I mean, you know, and I'm sort of able-bodied, and I can just kind of barely fit in the 16-digit number there, and I think, wow, you know, 30 years from now when I'm elderly and have like, you know, tougher hand time writing, you know, writing that, that would be really tough. Like, and then you look at the back of that piece of paper and there's just all this space. Like, why don't they give you more space to write in your credit card number and sign your name? I, I have you ever, have you looked at the forms at all? And you curious. We about? have, yeah, we, we actually have looked at our forms and, uh, you know, there's always work underway to, to improve the forms. What you're talking about is a billing statement from, you know, a hospital system or a provider. So that's not something that we send out, but we do send out the explanation of benefit documents. And uh, we have worked very hard to make sure that they don't look like uh, something that should just be discarded. But this idea of human-centered design is is really becoming more important to, to our company. And I think it's becoming more important to industry as a whole. You know, our members have expectations of how they interact with us 
not because they have had other interaction with Humana or United Healthcare, but because they've had interaction with McDonald's and uh, Panera and Patagonia and Walmart and Amazon, right? And so our competitive set has to be, how do we d- deliver really best of the best experience as opposed to best in class? Because even if we can get above average in healthcare, we're, we're still at the bottom of the barrel relative to other consumer interactions. And so we're keeping our eye on the prize at, you know, how do we get better overall, not just relative to kind of where we are right now and what our peer set is doing. Tell me about what you're doing in terms of trying working to improve the experience for the providers. That's a that's a great question. Um, we are farther ahead on our consumer journey than we are on our provider journey, but we are working on provider as well. But, you know, a lot of this is is uh, getting operational data correct. You know, do we have the right address in the system and the right hours? For our providers, are we paying claims accurately and on time? Uh, is the provider's ability to interact with us easier or harder than uh, how they interact with um, with other uh, payers in the system? And so, you know, we we do have a group that uh, focuses on uh, contracting with providers. You know, moving away from uh, the fee for service model that I talked about at the beginning and into a value based contracting model, which allows for uh, you know additional performance payments for providers that are providing the best quality of care. And um, so there's a lot of work underway there too. What do you think for a consumer is the best way to give feedback to a managed care company or, or a health insurance company? I've, you know, in some cases with my own health insurance, when, when like I just couldn't get satisfaction by calling customer service, I resorted to like mailing a letter to the CEO of the company. I looked up the headquarters address and actually then, you know, there's some kind of ombud squad that looks at that mail and, and they managed to kind of take care of this issue. But that probably wasn't, you know, the, I don't know if that's the best approach. What, what do you, you know, in, from your role, what, 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 what should consumers do if they're not getting satisfaction by just calling customer service? Yeah, if they're not getting satisfaction just through through calling in, uh, you know, I think reaching out electronically is helpful. Obviously, we monitor our social media channels, and that's you know for a consumer in any industry, that's always a, a route to take. Uh, I I hope that folks would receive satisfaction before having to send a letter to the CEO. Uh, and so I, you know, if you're having trouble with Centene, I'd rather have you send the letter to me than to, uh, and to, to our CEO. So that, I guess that would be an option too. <laughs> yeah. And, and the problem that I had was not with Centene. I'll, I want to make that clear. <laughs> and what about with, with, with states? So as Centene competes for contracts at the different state level, to what degree are states looking at the experience that managed care plans provide to patients beyond just sort of the the kind of the the fee for it to what degree yeah. are you seeing them evaluating your the experience that you provide yes yeah, states are super interested in the level of care that their citizens are receiving and uh, the the quality of care so both access you know can members get to providers the way they need to as well as you know what are the outcomes and so there are uh, several nationally uh, recognized and, and mandated sets of data that come out and that are measuring quality. And, and so, you know, we're always looking at, um, you know, making improvements on, on both the HEDIS and the CAPS uh, set of measurements. So those are the two primary sets of measurements that the government uh, mandates uh, gets evaluated. Do you see the idea of having a chief experience officer is that is that spreading do you talk to other chief experience officers to to swap notes yeah so the the chief experience officer title is starting to grow in popularity it probably first started 10 or 15 years ago primarily in hospitality businesses and and so hotels 
and hospital systems uh, have both really uh, been uh, thinking about this idea of experience kind of more broadly than other industries have, although I suspect it's going to grow in importance across other industries as well. I, I think, you know, a, as a marketer, I've seen a, a progression in the way uh, marketers think about their their craft. I mean, obviously there's an art and science to marketing. And I think many decades ago, we thought, you know, that advertising was the be all and end all of marketing activity. And they said, no, we can't just advertise our brand. We have to build the market. And so this idea of marketing kind of just beyond, you know, a single offering started to come up and then say, well, no, we have to do brand management. We, you know, people have to buy into the brands, not just buy the product that the brand offers. And so big consumer packaged goods companies have, have, you know, figured that out. Obviously others, you know, other industries have as well, but I think, this idea of uh, experience and thinking about a continuum of uh, of touch points across that uh, experience spectrum is important. And so we use the language of transaction engagement and relationship and how do we move transactions uh, into engagement realm. And, and if you have enough engagement, can you actually have a relationship with your your member or your consumer. And so I think this idea of having an experience officer is going to become more prominent, just like companies are, uh, you know, have both a CTO, chief technology officer, as well as a CIO, chief information officer. We're going to see uh, chief marketing officers in concert with a chief digital officer kind of paired up versus the CIO and CTO. And I think uh, depending on the organization, you'll see a growth of CXOs who are trying to synthesize what the brand experience should be, as well as what the product is offering, as well as what are the additional touch touch points that consumers are experiencing with regards to that, that broad brand proposition. How does that all come together? Let's dial the clock back a little bit. So you talked about you worked at Procter & Gamble, but before that, you went to the Naval Academy and you were a Marine for what, about about six years? That's uh, correct. I'd love to hear about how your Marine experience, your military life has uh, you know, impacted your professional career after that, either you know, leadership lessons that you've kind of used in your professional career or habits that you gained in the Marines. I'd lo- love to hear a little bit about how the Marine experience has, has stayed with you. Sure. So, you know, the Naval Academy and the U.S. Marine Corps are both uh, leadership organizations. And so, yes, I have a bachelor of science degree in English. I, I, I Officially, I have an English BS degree, which I think is a little bit amusing. But that school, you know, just like the other service academies are really designed to enhance people's, um, you know, ability to lead, which, you know, basic lo- uh, definition of leadership, I, I think, is getting people to do things that they wouldn't just do on their own. The Marine Corps is certainly a leadership organization. You know, the Marine Corps is an up or out organization. No one gets hired uh, as a general you have to start off as a lieutenant and kind of work your way up. And so I think there are similarities in corporate America to the the way the hierarchy, uh, you know, in the military service works. You know, Procter & Gamble certainly was a hierarchical organization, in many ways more bureaucratic than the Marine Corps was. I think the Marine Corps tended to be more decentralized. But I think three of the last six CEOs for P&G had military experience in, in their background. So we see a lot of um, similarities, uh, you know, in hierarchical organizations, but also in organizations that require empathy to get things done, which is pretty much every single one of them. I think the common misconception about the military is that people have to follow orders because it's the law that's not really a manifestation of good leadership. You know, you know, uh, authority can be given, but respect must be earned. And I think, you know, as we think about our place and our organizations and our communities, 
you know, you, you know, it's human nature to want to work with people that you enjoy working with and that you respect as opposed to somebody who's, who's bullying you. And, and I think, um, that general, uh, military experience has certainly helped me, you know, demonstrate a point of difference versus some of my peers who, especially early in my career, who didn't have a, a similar set of experiences. I was, I think 25 years old and I had 65 people, you know, in my organization, not a lot of 25 year olds that get that level of experience and certainly helps as you transition to corporate America to know how to get things done. Yeah, something I've heard from other military folks is, uh, is also a little bit of a sense of calm, uh, under stressful situations where, you know, um, sometimes in corporate life, it's like, oh my God, the the, the document we had a, a mistake right. in the mistake in the model. We have to redo all the pages. Right. And it's like, well, you know, we're not being shot at right now. So. Well, exactly. Well, <laughs> I've been I was 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 with Procter and Gamble about three months. I had a newborn at home. There's a lot of stuff going on, and and we were on our brand teams. We were going through our annual business review, which is a very stressful time. People were really freaking out. And I went over to a, another assistant brand manager who had been there a little bit longer than, than I had been, but who had served in the Navy. And I said, Chris, like, I don't, I don't get it. He's like, what, what are you talking about? Like, everybody's so stressed out, but no one's shooting at us. And he kind of laughed and kind of pushed his chair back and said, you know, you're right. That's, that's good perspective to have. You know, when when you're when you're trying to sell toilet paper, in general, lives are not in danger, and so it's always good perspective to to have. Uh, as sort of just parting thoughts, Dave, what would you say are things if someone was interested in you know kind of eventually getting promoted to a chief experience officer role? Uh, what are what are some kind of preparations or some uh, some important background for you know that someone should have for that? Yeah. Uh, number one is know what you do well and do that. You know, a lot of people are trying to figure out what the magic bullet is. And I've found that there's kind of two schools of thought. There's the, you know, Tony Robbins, the mo- motivational speaker, likes to tell people to find their passion and go do that. Mike Rowe, uh, you know, the host of Dirty Jobs, likes to say, well, find something that needs to be done and just love doing that. I, I think they're those are both good points of view. So wherever you are and whatever your job you're in, make sure that that's the best job you've ever had. And if it's not, then, you know, find something else to do, but know what your strengths are and play to those strengths, I think is, is item number, number one. Item number two is for people aspiring to, to any sort of executive leadership or uh, organizational leadership is be infinitely curious consume as much information as possible on as many different planes as possible. I mean, I, you know, probably the most successful marketing program that I ran as an ABM when I was uh, working on the Sherman brand, the idea came to me as I was reading outside magazine. I'm like, well, (laughs) paper manufacturing and the great outdoors don't have a ton in common uh, but you never know how your brain is going to connect ideas that will deliver a breakthrough. And so, you know, read as much as possible or, you know, listen to podcasts, however you consume information, but gain access to information as, as widely as you can and make sure that your brain is engaged and, and your curiosity is never sated. You know, learn more. Fantastic. Dave, thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure, Will. Thanks for having me, and uh, we should do it again sometime. Sounds good. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X.com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show. 
and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer. And I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening. <laughs>